Welcome to the Fish Casting Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner, and I'm here today with... Hey, everybody. I am Captain Tim. Well, guys, we got a really awesome podcast today. Um, we're going to talk about fishing this week, um, inshore and offshore. Tim's going to get into some more uh, snook fishing tactics. I know last week uh, our video got a lot of hits on YouTube. Not a ton via podcast, but a lot on YouTube. So if you are watching this on YouTube, remember you can listen to us on the go in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And uh, let's let's get right in. Well, all right, Tanner. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot to talk about. Uh, I wasn't able to get the boat out this week. Um, had some really windy conditions uh, over on the west coast of Florida, but I did I, I did try something a little different. Um, I know that, that you have pretty good luck fishing the rivers and, and you know, pretty much your rivers are our passes on this coast. Um, so I went out to John's Pass, which is a, a very popular fishing spot and a, a very popular area for boating and, and recreational beachgoers. Uh, John's Pass is a waterway that separates uh, Madeira Beach to the north and Treasure Island to the south. Uh, it's, it's maybe 150 yards wide, um, the pass itself, really good water flow, um, a lot of structure. Both, both sides are lined with riprap or pretty much concrete rubble. Um, so it's, it's a very fishy spot. You never know what you can catch there. I've caught grouper, snook, tarpon, trout, redfish, flounder over the years. It was always a good spot back growing up here to go and try late at night um, because it's it's open 24 seven. Um, and uh, I decided to try my hand at it for the first time in, in probably 10 years. I haven't been out there at this specific spot um, fishing for these snook. So uh, I went on Saturday night and we had a really strong wind about a 20 knot wind out of the south. I was on the north side, the Madeira beach side and I was casting with the uh, against the wind, trying to float my bait um, down current, which was an incoming tide. Um, so, so what I was doing was I was throwing artificials, uh, an ounce to an ounce and a half uh, bucktails. They're called flare hawks. They're, they're really big. They're, they're a big jig um, with the synthetic uh, um, fibers as kind of the, the, you know, they used to be made out of deer, um, deer tails. That's why they call them bucktail, male deer. <laughs> um, but these ones are synthetic. Um, you, you've seen them. I know you've seen them. Um, people call them flare hawks or bucktails. Um, I got I got one um, good hit. And uh, what I wanted to kind of talk about um, is, is just having to fish alongside others. So obviously, this is a public access area. I'm used to fishing off my boat. Um, at, at this particular evening, I was, I, I'll say shoulder to shoulder with people. But in reality, there was probably people 20, 25 feet uh, to my west, which is, which is off my right shoulder, and 15, 20 feet up to my east, which is my left shoulder. So, so, so Tim, you, you yes, were sir. keeping social distance. I just want to clarify oh, your, your six feet of social distance on both sides was maintained at all times. Yeah, I'll tell you this. Uh, if they would have come any closer, I would have told them to back up for social distancing. Um, so the way I, I fish these baits are, like I mentioned, I throw it up current and I, I reel in slow with an ounce and a half of weight, even in uh, the, the really strong incoming current, you know, maybe two knots of current, that bait gets down to the bottom quickly. And the way I work these flare hawks is I'll reel in slowly and I'll make a, a sweep. So as I'm reeling in slowly, the bait's kind of bouncing along the bottom, but it's also getting pushed laterally uh, down current. So it kind of it, it kind of mimics a bait fish uh, moving along the bottom, and and I've had a lot of success when you can get near the structure and when there aren't a lot of people around you. So this leads in, into my issue where I wanted to fish, people were already there. So instead of barging in um, like a lot of people would, I went to an area I wasn't super comfortable with. I knew that it wasn't going to be as productive, and I fished there. Um, I did have one good hit, like I said, I, uh, I timed it just right. So where, where there was a guy um, to, to the left of me who caught some little fish, like a whiting or something. And when he was reeling it in, I threw over to the structure where, where uh, the, the bridge pilings were so I could try to get, get a cast in there. And right when I hooked up and I got tight on the fish, 
the guy next to me decides, well, I got the fish off my line. I'm going to throw back out. He crossed me and he broke me off almost immediately. Oh. Um, yeah, he, he was using like two ounces of lead with the beads and, and the, the wire <laughs> leader and the uh, snap swivel. So my, uh, my 30 pound test uh, fluorocarbon leader and my 20, 20 pound test um, uh, main line didn't stand a chance. Uh, it, unfortunately, in that uh, situation, I had my bait out like 100 feet and he cut me off 20 feet from shore. So I lost a lot of line on that one. Um, so that was that was unfortunate. Um, I, I was able to to keep fishing. I retied. Um, I ended up losing four jigs, um, but I only one was the fish. Um, I was having to make some some uh, really risky throws just because where I was at, uh, I, I knew the fish were holding by the structure, and I had to I had to make some um, uh, casts that I normally wouldn't. Just timing it in between other people catching fish and fishing, and um, and, and just the conditions. So. Uh, I'm not going to make excuses. I, I did hook one fish. Uh, I don't know what it was. It, it felt like a good snook, had a good thump to it. Um, but, you know, it, it humbled me a little bit. Um, you know, you can't go out and, and catch a nice snook every time. So that was my fishing story. Um, not, not super duper sexy or anything, but, uh, you know, now I know um, if I want to get out and, and fish that area, I got I to gotta get there sooner than, than sunset. So that's my, uh, that's my snook tail for the week, uh, as lackluster as it is. You know, it happens to the best of us. And when I talk about my week, I'll, uh, I have some similar lamentations about snook and bridges. But just a couple questions first. Um, so you said sunset. So you were, you were fishing right after sunset when this happened? Uh, I got out there maybe um, 30 minutes before sunset. Um, my, my wife really wanted to go to the beach and, and watch the sunset on Friday night. Um, but after working all week, uh, it just it just didn't work out. Um, we didn't weren't able to make it out. So we decided to stay in. So on Saturday night, I said, all right, darling, we're going to go see the sunset. Um, but there, it comes with a caveat. I'm going to bring my fishing <laughs> pole and uh, I'm going to try to try to fish. So she went down the uh, jetty a little bit and um, watched the sunset um, for the, the last half an hour um, until the sun, you know, disappeared over the horizon. So that was about the time I was fishing, maybe maybe 30 to 45 minutes tops. Um, not really exactly sure how long I was out there. Yeah, man, that's, that's tough. Um, I think I've been out of John's Pass one time on a head boat with my cousin about five years ago. And we went out um, I can't remember the name of the head boat, but I, I want to say it was out of one of the little beach towns. And I remember yeah. Treasure Island because I'd never heard of Treasure Island before. And we caught small red groupers and grunts. And they told grunts. us grunts were gray snappers. And yep. I, I called them on the phone. I was like, so what do you guys catch out there? Like, how far? And they're like, well, you know. We're, we're trying to get these red and uh, black groupers because they had a permit where they could keep black groupers out of, or gag groupers. I can't remember if they were blacks or gags. Um, Probably but gags. They, they could keep them out of season because they had to give the heads to the University of Florida to like research. Oh. But um, we were fishing for red groupers and um, uh, gag groupers, but they said there's lots of gray snappers. And I was like, gray snappers, sweet. I love gray snappers. Mm -hmm. um, and by gray snapper, my cousin, I think at the time, he was a freshman or sophomore in high school, and he's a very, uh, he might even have been in eighth grade, but he was, he was very disappointed that our gray snappers were not actually uh, Lugianus gresis, the uh, gray or more commonly mangrove snapper. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that, that's really common, um, especially it, uh, around these parts uh, with, with those head boats and, and, and misidentifying the fish. Um, it's a it's a little um, it, it adds some shine and luster to when tourists are booking uh, and they hear that they're going to catch these gray snapper. But I'm guessing that was probably one of the Hubbard's marina boats, the friendly fishermen or Florida fishermen. They're both tucked right inside the pass there. And, and Tanner, I don't know if you remember, it was probably three or four years ago, our mutual friend uh, Rob, you and I went out in, in my old boat um, and it was pretty windy. We fished some some local artificial reefs. Um, we went out of John's Pass then as well. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, we were drifting, drifting for groupers. I remember getting a couple. I still had a picture for a while of a of a pretty decent. I think they were all a little bit too short, but they were still good sized groupers. 
Yeah, I, I think I think we, we put maybe two or something uh, keeper ones. But yeah, we were drifting some uh, some uh, hard bottoms, natural hard bottom um, up off Madeira Beach. And we also fished some of those artificial reefs that uh, I don't really like to do very much because of how busy they are. But I think that was in the middle of the week and, and we, we made a shot at it. I can't remember. Um, yeah, the conditions were I, not the conditions were not great because I think our plan was to run out and go catch lane snappers like 50 miles yeah. out and the, the the conditions did not permit no no i i i remember it was not not great but but i think we got it done i can't remember you know they blend after a while i hate to say it they do uh they do and last question tell me about the the pier catwalk or actually like what are you fishing off of like how is it um is it parallel to the bridge is it like a, a person bridge how, how is that uh set up so where I was fishing was um, pretty much on a seawall that's kind of lined with this rubble material that goes out to a jetty out into the Gulf of Mexico. And it runs perpendicular to the bridge. So I, I kind of get down on that rubble and I'm throwing out perpendicular to the seawall and my bait is drifting into the bridge pilings to the bridge span itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that gives me a nice visual. So you're you're basically standing on, is that the north or the south side of the seawall of the pass? I was on the north side, throwing north south. Side. Yeah, so I was throwing directly into the wind. I, I find that that side uh, used to produce a lot better. Um, but I generally, like I said earlier, I fish that area late at night usually. That was always somewhere that we went well after hours, 10, 11, maybe midnight. Um, there's less people there and it seems like it's more productive. There's a lot of lights in the area and the, the snook like to hang out next to the structure in the shadow line where the, the bridge blocks the light from the uh, light standard. So it's a good spot, tarpon, redfish, snook, like I said. Um, I've hooked some snook down there on some really heavy tackle that are impossible to stop. Um, throwing big ladyfish, you know, foot long ladyfish is bait. So um, I'll get out there again. Um, I just, I just uh, need to hone my technique or need to stay up later, one or the other. Yeah, you know, it happens, it happens to the best of us. Absolutely. All right, Tim. So, yep. Oh, continue, continue, my bad. No, I was going to say, uh, uh, um, give us a fish story where maybe you actually caught something. I can't wait to hear how you did this week. All right, you want me to lead with the inshore or the offshore? Uh, go with the inshore. I know the offshore. You just you just got back earlier today, right? So uh, I, I did. I've been home less than an hour. All right. Well, I don't know. Whatever you want to do, but maybe take us in chronological order so we can relive the time frame as you. All right. Through. All right. So, like I said, the mullet have been running. I think this week they were thinner than they were the last two weeks. So the last two weeks they've been thick. This week there was still bait, but it was not at the same level that it was a couple weeks ago. So um, I went, I wanna say three days in a row. I can't remember exactly which days. One day I went to the beach and the problem when I went to the beach, I had just fished the bridge. So on the bridge, I'm using heavy tackle, heavy leader. My drag was cranked all the way down. I hooked a fish on the beach. Oh, that was on Friday and it popped me off um, because mm. my drag was too tight. And so then I went back to the pier and the first fish I hooked cut me off because my drag was too loose. It reminds me of something my dad used to say when I was a kid, whenever you pick up a rod, check the drag. Because usually I, I fish the same type of fishing. I'm not going from such a drastic disparity of fishing a wide open beach to fishing an incredibly heavy structure pier in such a short period of time, but I was, and um, I, I, I popped a couple of fish off Friday. Um, we were, we, we went to the beach in the morning. I popped that one fish off. We we're planning to have a half day in the boat. I wanted to go for yellowtails. Um, bought bait, we're on our way to the marina. Um, a car cuts in front of me. I slam on my brakes, my car cuts off. Um, I don't know exactly how slamming on my brakes happened, but it turns out my fuel pump broke. So huh. I could not get to the marina in times because I had to sit and wait for a tow truck for two hours. And we only had a half day reservation with the boat club. 
So by the time we got the tow truck and my friend got his car, it was already like 1030. And I was like, you know, what? we, we, we have a whole truck full of bait. Um, let's just walk down to the seawall. I doubt we're going to get anything at 1030, um, but we're, we're going to try. So we pulled some really good mangroves out, you know, just fishing the seawall through a chum bag. You know, we probably caught 20 mangroves, but four of them were nice uh, 14 inch mangroves and they were eating whole live mullet. Um, so that was exciting. The next day I went there by myself um, pretty early. It, it seems like this is the window when I'm getting these snook, at least in the river, is between 6.45 and 7.15. That's it. They do not bite before. Hmm. You might get one at like 6.39, but that window <laughs> seems to be like, I've been getting there at 6, and I don't get a bite for 20, 30 minutes, and then as soon as you see the sun start to peak until the sun is fully up, is the only time those snook have been biting. So um, I was trying to use 20 and 30 pound test. And I think I broke off five snook. I mean, I don't know that mm. they were snook, but presumably uh, based on where I was fishing and what I was using, um, I broke off four or five snook. Very disappointed. I ended up catching uh, at about eight, eight o'clock, 8.30. I caught about a um, 12 incher. Um, and I broke off like another probably 20 incher, but at least I could see it, you know, it broke off, Yeah. you know, there's a, there's another level of satisfaction when at least like, you know, that if your life depended on it, you probably could have caught that fish, but mm -hmm. since your life didn't depend on it, it's not worth, you know, jumping in the water to get your hands on a 20 inch snook when it can break off. So the next morning, I decided I was going to go back and get 60 pound leader, lock mm. down drag, and see if I could just winch because they're they're right on this little point. Um, you know, there's like the fenders um, on the side of the bridge. So this mm -hmm. bridge has like fenders on both sides, and the fenders come out, and there's like a little dock, and at the very tip of the fenders, this is where the snook hang out. So I get out there. I got my friend out there. I think I told you last week he missed his like first snook. He didn't get it all the way out of the water. Um, mm -hmm. So we get down there and like clockwork at around 650, bam. This time I got the, the 50 or the 60 pound test, the lockdown 50 pound line. And I just back it out, like walking backward, pulling it. And, you know, it, it stinks that such a great fish that could put up such a good fight doesn't get the opportunity to put up that good fight, but I still caught it. And it, it was a 28 incher, so technically a keeper. I yep. didn't keep it. Um, my friend, he was using 60 pound leader, but he still, I think he has 30 pound braid, but he was lucky enough. He got a hit while he was reeling in. So he already had a bit of a running start on it. And he pulled mm -hmm. out a 29 incher just shortly after me. And again, he was going to keep it, but decided not to. And then I cast in there again, because we were just having to switch off because they weren't hitting anywhere else besides this one little hole that was about two feet by two feet. And, you know, it's a tough cast you have to make to even get in there. Um, and so I pulled out a third one, 715. He went to work. He had to get, get out of there. Um, and I went and I tried a few other spots. I ended up pulling out a 20 incher a couple hours later. I mean, a couple hours, probably like at 8.30. I think I was home by nine. Uh, but a jack hit it on the surface. And I guess the snook saw the jack and the snook kind of chased out the jack and hit it right on the surface. I was just walking down the seawall trolling the bait huh. to catch that. Um, that last little one, but all, for the big ones, you really need to be in that uh, magic window. Yeah. Now, Tanner, why do you speculate that um, the, the timing is so important? What, what, do you think it's the way the sun comes up or do you have any insight to why that magic 30, 40 minute window is, is so productive? I, I really don't know. Uh, I mean, I, Snook, I've always heard our, our nighttime feeders. Um, I, I think that has to do something with like there's enough light so they can see better. Uh, maybe that makes the bait run because this is a pretty tight little choke point coming in this river. So I know there's a lot of fish coming in there, but 
it is it is bizarre that this this window is is when they've been biting, but that just seems to be the the trend. Yeah, I mean, if you got them patterned, you know, you, you gotta you gotta stick with it. You know, it seems like you've done a good job putting your time in uh, all throughout the day, and now you know when the bite's hot. Absolutely, and it, it kind of stinks that now. The for the next couple of days, the tide's probably too high, so I might try to get out there again on Friday, but. I went down there this morning just to go look for bait um, before we went offshore and I, I didn't see, uh, I mean, I threw out there for a minute and I got like a light tap, but it, it wasn't like it was uh, yesterday and the day before. Yeah. All right, so moving on to my offshore trip. Um, offshore, I'm really just getting experimental, trying different things. Um, we started off going for the yellowtail and it was it was one one incident after another. Um, we the the chum bag came untied and floated away. So when we were going to get the chum bag out, uh, we turns out the anchor it was hung on some sort of rock, and we ended up bending the anchor shaft. Um, so oh boy. we were able to get enough yellowtails as to where or not yellowtails. We didn't get any yellowtails. We were able to get enough ballyhoo to where I was you know, ready to just, I didn't want to mess with the anchor. I don't know if it would have anchored us. I feel that it would have been very difficult to try to anchor again. So we decided that we wanted to do drift fishing. So the other day I'd been drift fishing out in 300. So that's where we wanted to start. Um, and when we'd gotten to 300 before, we'd gotten quite a mix of fish. And today it was nothing but tiles. We were catching hmm. a ton of tiles, I guess. It wasn't nothing but tiles primarily tiles. Um, and we caught a lot of these black line tile fish, um, but we were able to pull out a good size vermilion snapper, about 13 inches, so a keeper uh, vermilion and a black fin snapper um, in that first drift. And we did a long drift and we had something else hit our flat line. And I don't know what it was, it was very odd may have been a small shark, but it, we saw it next to the boat and it was just kind of chewing on the ballyhoo right behind the boat. I kind of looked like, a, like it, I thought it was a king, but I don't know kings to just chew on a bait like that. So I, I really don't know uh, what that could have been. Interesting. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a king, does it? No, no, it doesn't. But I mean, we were in 300 and who knows. So then we, uh, we decided to go a little shallower and try some wrecks in about 250. And the second drop, we, I believe we got into a school of Almaco jacks. So we got one nice Almaco to the boat. Um, we both got broken off twice. Um, I got a nice blue runner to the boat that got hit by a shark. Um, and then we got another black fin snapper mixed in there with the Almacos. And we ended up getting two more black fin snappers uh, which are interesting. They've recently removed the keeper size. So blackfin snapper used to have to be 12 inches, but I think it's because the barrow trauma is so bad because you catch them so deep. The survivability is almost nil. So they got rid of that. So we, we got a couple black fins. We got a couple, um, got a couple tiles. Um, we got a nice Almaco and uh, yeah, it was, oh, and we caught a huge shark on the flat line as well. So that was, that was fun just to have something really scream and drag um, as well. So I, I don't know if I would call it, uh, oh, we also got a bunch of tile fish and one undersized mutton. Um, so we, the, these muttons just, we only fished for muttons for like an hour at the end because I knew they would just torment me and send me their <laughs> 16 inches like they always seem to do. Yeah. And sure enough, I was right. You know, I, live ballyhoo dropped it down there, heavyweight long leader. 16 and a half inch mutton. It's, it's, it's like <laughs> clockwork. I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but that, uh, that seems to always happen. All right. Well, that is about time for that. We're, we're at a good time to move on. Tim, can you tell me what the fish of the week is? Yeah, Tanner, this week we are doing the peacock bass. The peacock bass? Is that a single species of bass? Well, the peacock bass, uh, uh, not native to Florida, 
But uh, yeah, I believe it's a uh, single species of bass. Uh, tell me more if you, if you know. Well, the peacock bass we have in Florida is called the butterfly peacock bass, Chichla ocellaris. Um, but it's one of about 12 species of peacock bass oh. that live in the greater Amazon basin in that part of South America. So even though there's only one peacock bass species that we have here in Florida, in South America, there are actually several. So, all right, so the peacock bass were introduced to Florida in the 1980s by the FWC because other species of tilapia, I believe the spotted tilapia was the primary species that were breeding, um, overpopulating, and they needed something to control the population because our native largemouth bass were not preying on those spotted tilapia. Do you have any uh, insight on the, the butterfly peacock bass? Well, well, thanks for letting me know there's 12 of them. <laughs> um, peacock bass in general, I didn't know there were nearly that many. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the same thing that, that I heard is that they were introduced by Fish and Wildlife, which is counterintuitive to me. Um, if you want something to, to prey on another invasive species, Usually it's weird to bring in a, a hyper-aggressive non-native species. Um, so I know that the largemouth bass, the native largemouths um, are kind of, I don't want to say struggling, but with another predatory uh, hyper-aggressive fish in the area, I know that that was kind of, a lot of people question that decision. Yeah, um, it definitely, I, I think it almost seems like the, the tilapia excuse was something done under the guise of them wanting to get them because they are such a popular game fish and they're unique to this very small area. Fun fact, there are a few lakes in Palm Beach County where you can catch, there are four top predator species, largemouth bass, peacock bass, um, clown knife fish. That's another one we'll have to have a, mm -hmm. a daily fish of in the future and hybrid striper white bass. So you can catch all four of these, you know, top predator freshwater fish in Lake Ida. And I can't remember, there's another lake that's basically connected to Lake Ida where, the, where they have the big four. Um, I, I would love to get the slam there, but I've only fished there. I fished there twice. One time I only caught peacocks and night fish. And then the other time I only caught largemouth. So um, it just depends. I, I've caught a lot of peacocks fishing in Miami and maybe next time I'll go peacock fishing, I'll get a little deeper, but in the interest of time, I'll let you uh, drop on us some peacock stories. Yeah, I, I don't have a ton of them. I've only targeted peacock bass a handful of times down in South Florida. I've done uh, peacock fishing in Miami. I've done it um, over in Naples, Marco Island area, but it's all those um, man-made canals, pretty much ditches that uh, were dug either parallel to or, or running near Alligator Alley or any of those um, canals over in Miami. Um, I know most people like to use the shiners that you can buy at bait shops. Um, that seems to be a very popular uh, um, bait, but I actually, I like, actually like using artificials for peacocks. I, I seem to um, catch a lot more, even fishing side by side with someone with shiners. Um, my go-to lure is the Rapala X-Wrap um, in like the two and a half inch variety. It seems to be really good, just dynamite, um, lipped hard swimming bait lure that uh, I've done really well with the peacocks in the past. So um, the peacocks I've caught aren't huge with the big hump heads, anywhere between half a pound, maybe up to close to two pounds, but they are a, a heck of a fight on light tackle and uh, something really exotic to catch here in, 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 you know, a place that you grew up in and it's just kind of cool. Uh, but, but normally as a conservationist and a steward of the environment, I wouldn't like to see the non-natives, but it's still a neat fish to catch. I, I agree on all points. I, I do think it's a bit of an odd um, thing that was done, but I, I have taken advantage of it in my yeah. time here in Miami. Okay, let's uh, transition to our next and final segment, uh, questions of the week. Uh, the first question we have is from pbuck95, 
And he asks us about bananas and if we think there is any truth to the rumors uh, that they're bad luck on a fishing boat. Ooh, that is a good question. And uh, definitely a very hot topic in the fishing community. You mind if I uh, roll with this one real quick, Tanner? Absolutely, Tim, go for it. So myself, as far as bananas, um, I'm not superstitious about them. Um, if I have a choice whether or not to bring them, I generally don't bring them <laughs> um, just because why risk it? Um, I love bananas. I think they're a perfect snack, especially for offshore um, because they're in a wrapper that you can throw over the side and it's gonna decompose. Um, I just, I don't really pay much attention to it. I, I, you know, either way, I'm kind of wishy-washy on it. It's not going to ruin my day if a guest of mine brings a banana on the boat. I'm not going to throw it overboard. Um, I'm not going to go as far as to cut out someone's Fruit of the Loom label off their pants that maybe has a banana in it. You know, I've heard, I've heard uh, the whole <laughs> stories of that. Um, but fun fact, there isn't a banana in the Fruit of the Loom label. That's just kind of a a myth about charter captains doing that. Um, but it, it, it's funny, I, I'm more interested in kind of the, the maritime lore of it all, you know, how it began, how it started. You know, I've heard everything from, you know, spiders uh, hang out in banana clusters and then the, the folks that worked on the banana boats that brought them from South America could get bit and, and die. I've heard that, you know, when a banana boat sinks, all you find are the bananas that are left over because they float. Um, you know, the South American weather where they harvest the bananas can be really bad. So if you're on one of the boats that brings bananas to and from uh, the US or other countries, you're bound and destined for danger. So, you know, when it comes to those things, I think it's neat how the, the origin stories of it all, but I don't pay too much attention to bananas. Uh, how about you, Tanner? Yeah, I think that's a pretty spot on analysis um, as far as the history goes. I do agree that I rather people not bring bananas on my boat. I don't, I don't personally like bananas very much. So I would never bring a banana on the boat, but I have seen people bring bananas on the boat and go forward to have a good day of fishing unhampered by the banana. So it's definitely not uh, an end all be all as far as that goes. All right, guys, I wanted to do another question, but we're already running a little bit long. Uh, the last couple have been really long, so we're tr really trying to keep it to 30 minutes or below. So we're going to have to save. Uh, I appreciate. I have a couple other really good questions um, we'll get to next week. Um, but other than that, remember to like and subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify. Um, if you're on iTunes, give us five stars. We really appreciate you listening and we welcome any feedback. And maybe next week is the week we're going to get a guest because I keep talking about it, but it is going to happen eventually. Tim, you have any parting words? No, uh, not really. Um, hopefully I can, I can be more successful in fishing and, uh, uh, and have some better content for next week. But um, if you want to see some stuff, uh, you can check me out at Captain Strip on Instagram. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.